Hello and welcome to Elector Engineering Insights, the show that puts your engineering challenges to the industry's experts. I'm your host, Stuart Cording. For those involved in the development of embedded systems, you'll have been unable to avoid the clamour around RISC-V. Traditionally, we're used to hearing about ARM, MIPS and even x86. So why do we need another processor architecture? What makes it so interesting to product developers? And how do you go about building it into a product? To answer these questions and more, I'm joined by Martin Kroom of Greenways Technologies and Simon Davidman from Imperus Software. So, hi Martin. Perhaps hi, you could Joe. just give us a quick introduction to yourself and also uh, Greenwaves. Yeah, so my name is Martin Kroom. I'm Vice President of Marketing for Greenwaves. Um, we are a fabulous semiconductor company based in Grenoble in France. Uh, and we're making use of RISC-V in, in the products that we develop. Super. And Simon from Imperus, a couple of words from you too. Brilliant. Yes, thanks, Stuart. Yes, so my name's Simon Davidman. I am um, work for a company, Imperus Software. I'm the CEO and founder, and actually I have a CTO role as well because I'm very much technical. I spent my whole career developing what's EDA tools around simulation and technology like that and most recently uh, founded in Pyrrhus, and we're based in the UK near Oxford. Super, thanks very much. I'm just going to take a break away from you guys for a second and um, to introduce today's sponsor, which is Eisler, powerful PCB prototyping made in Germany. If you're looking for beautiful boards, stellar stencils, an amazing assembly, visit Eisler.net. And if you're new to Eisler, use the discount code LCCBBL to receive a 30 euro discount and the chance to win a Volterra V1 PCB printer. Just upload your design files by the end of June 2022. So now while I have plenty of RISC-V questions for my guest, this is a live show and it lives from the questions that you share with us. So if you have any questions and issues that are troubling you, Regardless of where you are watching, you can post your questions directly to us. Throughout the show, we'll do our best to get answers or guide you to resources that might help. And between the shows, you can also get in touch with me, Stuart Cording, directly via email or Twitter. So without any further ado, let's go back to Martin and find out some more about the fabulous Greenwaves company and how they're using RISC-V. So welcome back, Martin. Hi again. <laughs> so tell us a little, a little bit more about Greenwaves, um, what, why you've started a, a fabulous semiconductor company and what role RISC-V is playing in your product. Yeah, so Greenwaves is, um, is a company that's actually designing chips and then producing them inside um, fabs. Those are manufacturing houses. That's why we call ourselves a fabulous company because we don't actually do the manufacturing. Uh, so we've been, we've been uh, in the market for about seven years. Uh, we've got 40 people um, spread around Grenoble, uh, Bologna, um, and the sales office in Shanghai. Um, and really, our focus is to deliver um, processors which are for DSP and AI mixed tasks in devices that are extremely energy constrained. So think of devices that are so small, have very, very small batteries that need to last for a day like an earbud or something like that, um, to sensor products which need to last for years on a battery. Uh, we have one product in production, uh, Gap 8, uh, which has been out for two years. And we have just started to ship our next generation product, Gap 9, um, to our lead customers. Um, and one point just, just interesting is that the, a lot of what we do is based obviously on RISC-5. RISC-5 is open source, but we also have a lot of interaction with open source projects. Uh, one particularly called Pulp, which comes out of ETH Zurich and University of Bologna. Super. Now, obviously, the the Gap, like you said, the Gap Eight product is already out there on the market. What type of applications are they addressing, and that need this this level of um, sort of intense processing? Yeah. Um, well, Gap Eight was really based on a vision that we developed like six, seven years ago, and really we were very focused at the time in the idea that. IoT sensors were going to stop being things like temperature and humidity and start have start having sensors in them which were going to capture much richer data like cam uh, cameras capturing images or infrared images or radar 
or biosignals and so on. And that we were going to need to process that on the sensor at very, very low power um, so that we could kind of compress the data down to something simple and send it over a, you know, a radio network, a low speed radio network. And that's really what's happened with GAP-8. So we've seen GAP-8 used mostly in um, building sensors, doing things like counting number of people in a room uh, with mm -hmm. our products in the market now with GAP-8 inside them, which are doing that kind of thing. We've also seen GAP-8 used to wake up larger devices. So as something that's always on looking for maybe a sound or a person or an object or a thing, uh, and then switching something else on. So it'd be something like the, um, the the speakers, the smart speakers we've in our homes looking for a, like a, um, a wake up. Maybe a smart door lock, smart door okay. lock or uh, something of that sort. Again, we're really focused on energy constraints. So we have to be in a situation where, you know, energy is, is, is important. Yeah. So with the GAP-8 and GAP-9, looking at the, the devices themselves, there's many, many RISC-V cores in there. I think there's uh, eight in the GAP-8 and, and around 10 in total in, in the GAP-9. Mm. When you started developing this uh, application, obviously there's, there's, as I said in the introduction, there are many other suppliers of IP that you could have used. Why go for RISC-V? There's a few reasons. Um... One thing that's very linked to the fact that we work very closely on open source projects um, with, and our CTO was one of the co-founders of the Pulp project um, at uh, ETH in Ninebo. And, and in fact, at the time, they weren't using RISC-V. They were using another core. Uh, they were using um, OpenRISC, which, which, which was a precursor to RISC-V. And, and actually moved across to RISC-V. What RISC-V gives us in the context of working on open source research projects is a kind of IPR license-free environment that we can work with those universities. So we don't get into the kind of discussions that sometimes are quite complex with universities about who owns the IP at the end of the uh, project. That's our kind of research wing. Yeah. Then we take that, obviously, that IP, and, and you know, semiconductors are a complicated area where bits can be open source, but other bits cannot be open source. Um, so we take that and then we, we build a, um, a chip out of it with IP that we develop, IP that we buy, um, and obviously all of the secret source we put into integrating all of this. Um, and, and, and then that, that kind of comes out. Um, the second thing that RISC V gives us is the ability to uh, innovate around the instruction set. Um, and this is quite unique. And at the time when we started Greenways, it was probably very difficult to do with ARM. Um, at, at the time, it required um, uh, an architectural license, would, which would have been extremely expensive. Um, this is less true these days, but 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 it would have been would have been a problem at the time because you know we didn't have a lot of money when we started up. We had a you know a vision which you know six years seven years ago, putting AI into a battery powered device was considered to be a somewhat silly idea. Uh, now it isn't. Um, so um, so so. That ability to actually innovate both in terms of the instruction sets that the cores implement and also in the memory architecture and the architecture of the cores and how they're implanted inside the chip are, are two things which are very important to us. And as an example, just in the instruction sets, the ability to innovate in that area can give us just on a single core three to four times more energy efficiency than wow. if we didn't have that ability. Um, so it, it's, it's quite significant. So the, the risk, I think it's important also just to highlight that risk five is an instruction set architecture. It's an ISA and it's basically a, a document, I guess we could describe it's it as. a piece of paper. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. That describes how this processor architecture is constructed and also has descriptions of how a limited set of instructions function. And a yep. company like yours can go in there and just take um, some of it or all of it. And there's also, as you said, that gap for, for custom instructions as well. But yeah. um, obviously, uh, and as an ISA, it's also open source, and open source is then immediately linked to free. But obviously, it doesn't, it isn't free just to build a chip. So, um, you know, so what what are the, the the financial costs involved in in bringing one of these things to market? Is is there an open source uh, VHDL or Verilog? Um, core that you can just take, or do you have to actually develop that core yourself? Is that the best approach when you're developing? There, there, there are a ton five? of cores around, um, both open source and and also um, cores where you can license um, designs um, of RISC-V. 
Uh, there are cores that you could run on FPGA that you can download and you can, you know, get an FPGA and run them straight away. Um, so, so yeah, you can do a lot of playing around with Risk Five as a hobbyist quite easily. Um, obviously, when you start to make a, um, a commercial SOC, the, the, the costs involved get quite a bit higher quite quickly. Um, basically, you know, the, the, the costs are driven obviously by the process that you're you're producing your chip in, and then mask and production costs are very very uh, high. Um, but there's a couple of things which Risk Five kind of adds in in that area. And you're right in saying, you know, Risk Five is just a load of pieces of of, of paper, but it's also um, an ecosystem that's around those pieces of paper that are developing development tools. Uh, they're getting, you know, GCC to run with and compile code to Risk Five and support all of these different extensions and so on and so forth. Um, uh, companies like Empiris, who are who are, you know, in within that ecosystem. Uh, of companies that that are that are producing tools for Risk Five, and that's super important because without the tools, uh, you know, if we were to come with a chip with some specialized instruction set architecture and go to our customers and say, "Hey, use this," uh, they're going to go, "Well, no, we don't want to learn any new tools." We're, you know, does it support GCC? Is, is there a GCC version for it? No, we yeah. don't want to program an assembly language and so on. So the tools are super important around it. And that's part of having this um, very rich, um, you know, and very large companies supporting, uh, supporting uh, um, uh, risk five. And, and, yeah. and this, this is this, this slide is actually talking to some of those, those points in the sense of, you know, some of the things that actually are causing risk five to, to, to be there. Um, one thing which is quite important is that a lot of the risk five that's actually out there you don't actually see um it's all embedded microcontrollers inside things so if you're building for example a power management device and you want a little core well mm -hmm. you can just take a risk five core download it from you know github and start using it and in a lot of cases these cores have been you know looked at by lots of eyes and lots of eyes means less bugs um, and probably exactly. better security as well. Um, so, you know, those things are really, really nice from a designer perspective. And that's where Risk Five has really, you know, been very, very successful. Most people now, I say, most chip designers, if they need a core, they're not going to expose it to a customer. They'll use a Risk Five core or something, something very like it. Huh? Yeah. Um, and that kickstarted the 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 development tools. But we're, you know, we're using Risk Five really from a perspective of innovation and not really from a perspective of, hey, it's free because making a chip is an expensive thing to do. Yeah. So RISC-V as a processor, um, obviously that's that's available there, but then there's also other sort of standard bus interface. Like I think it's the AMBER bus is, is common, commonly used for, for data and address communication with, with memories. And then you've also got the peripherals. Um, so how, how do you make a decision as to how to interface everything on the chip and how much time of your time is spent on risk five development compared to uh, developing all the other features and peripherals that you want inside your, your GAP9 processor? I, I think that's the, the second point is the key to this is, is that we really, you know, risk five is definitely important to us and the cores are definitely important to us and the core design is definitely important to us. But there's so many more things to get nine. Um, you know, there's there's all of the interface stuff. There's all the uh, there's a very sophisticated architecture in a sense that gap nine is the combination of a you know compute cluster with as you said nine cores inside it plus a microcontroller core with a very advanced uh, peripheral um, uh, uh, management unit with you know very low latency DSP capability uh, all kind of inside this one chip and those things are all either ips that we've developed completely in-house or ips that we've developed as part of our open source partnership with pulp uh, or their ips that we're buying um, and, and in the end of it the the core itself is actually quite a small portion of that um, but as i said coming back to it it does allow us to get these kind of benefits this is this is an example of of, of just adding a few instructions uh, to an ISA and what that can do in terms of um, speeding up a particular operation. Now, adding instructions is not something that you do kind of when you, you know, all the time, because obviously if you keep adding instructions, you end up with a core which is huge and uses a load of power. And since we're very interested in having low power, that's not a good idea. 
Um, but but some things, you know, where where there's a really general case, and this in this case there's 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 three things going on here. Uh, one is 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 um, post post increment store stores and loads. Um, the other thing is um, vectorized uh, dot products, uh, eight-way vectorized dot products, and hardware loops. And if, if you add those three things, uh, you're going from essentially um, classic uh, RISC-5 32 IMC instructions to these extra instructions. Uh, you, you essentially get nine times less instructions. So in fact, what happens is that this loop executes nine, uh, four times less and overall, there's nine times less instructions. And that's the kind of, and, and the benefit to us is, you know, this actual, ins, these extensions were specified over six years ago as part of the pulp project. Yeah. And, and in, in gap eight and gap nine, they're already there. And if we need something new, we just specify it and it's already there. Okay, yes, we've got to do the verification. We've got to do all of the things which are very important from a ship perspective, but it gives us an amazing ability to uh, innovate um, and, and to innovate and to bring something which is really good for our customers to market. So how does that innovation present itself to the code developers, the, the embedded system developers that are using it? When they're using GCC, are they able just to continue to write C code and those extended um, instructions are all absorbed and used as, as required? Or is there still a certain amount of inline assembler that needs to be done in order to make use of these, these extra capabilities? Great question. Um, in most cases, um, the optimizer we've we've enhanced the optimizer in GCC to to cover these uh, these these instructions, these extra instructions, and there are other standards type things happening around these kind of instructions uh, extensions, which which are helping that to get into other tools as well. Um, and uh, so, in most cases, things, for example, like a hardware loop, where there's a loop setup instruction, which you can see there. Um, where you don't need to do a test in each cycle of the loop, that's going to be detected by a compiler. Um, there are some things that probably don't get detected by a compiler. A, a, and in fact, this uh, dot product instruction that you could see there, which is actually a, a four-way eight-bit um, uh, uh, dot product, uh, vectorized dot product, so Mac and accumulate, so it's doing four Macs, four, uh, four Macs at, this, at the time. Uh, that's something that's quite difficult um, for a compiler optimizer to spot. So there we have built-ins in the compiler that you can select that um, instruction. Um, okay. But in general case, you know, the optimization just happens. Now, of course, if we look at the, the, the microcontroller industry and the embedded processor industry, somewhere where I've worked for the last 20 years, most people are quite content to put a single core on a chip and um, and deal with all the complexities of that but you've gone straight into developing a multi-core processor um, what are the challenges of putting more than one core on a chip from the perspectives of designing the chip through to interfacing it and then of course to getting the most of out of it when embedded developers want to program on it yeah well first first perhaps give a little bit of background why we did it um, because that will actually lead to the other the answers to the other questions um, essentially, one of the base things that we're doing is exploiting parallelism inside algorithms. And that's because the algorithms that we're using, that we're doing, are really highly parallelizable. Um, we're, we're really doing a mix of, of DSP tasks and uh, neural network type uh, tasks. Well, neural networks are very, very embarrassed, what, what, what you call embarrassingly parallel, um, yeah. in the sense that, that um, you can split up the problem and just run it on separate cores. Um, now, when you run something on separate cores, on you know you, you've got eight cores instead of, instead of one core, you're you're hopefully expecting the thing to go faster, right? Um, so that's known as speed up. So ideally, you would like it to go eight times faster if you've got eight cores. Well, of course, you know the real world. Uh, there's another problem, which is data, which is getting data to those cores and feeding them data so that they can work, and um, you need to feed them data in something that's very high speed so that those cores can load and store to that high speed thing. Um, so the main challenge with, with multi-process is, is that high speed thing, um, getting the data to them. The second challenge with, with multiple cores is that every now and then you need to synchronize. You need to come back to a point where you're running something on one core and synchronize and then fork again, go out to the eight cores. And basically you're constrained by this single core task. 
it's known as Amdahl's law, and it's it's constraining in terms of. Uh, so that's the second big constraint that you get in a parallel system. So we have some tools that we actually deliver with the chip, uh, particularly a foundational tool that we call an auto tiler, uh, which is something which actually chops up all of the data that's presented to kernels that you're running on this compute cluster, chops it all up and moves it in and out behind the processing that's going on. Um, and it's a tool which actually generates C code. So it generates the code necessary to do all of this movement that you can read, that you can debug, that you can see afterwards. And also, of course, we have huge kernel libraries covering tons and tons and tons of different things. Processor <laughs> companies, we're a hardware company, but we have more people doing software than we have doing hardware, like most hardware companies. I was going to say, it sounds like a familiar story. <laughs> So I'm just going to take a break there for a minute and see what questions have been coming in while we've been talking. Um, so actually, there's there's quite a few comments uh, coming in at the moment. <clears throat> so here's an interesting one. Um, we've got E2JW from Denver, Colorado, and they're asking, how do you distinguish this DSP from existing ADI and TI DSPs that are already very power efficient and computationally powerful? So I, I've what got that extra your slide that? at the end, just past the, the last one, which would be a great one to put in there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so how is it how is it how is what we're doing different to a classic DSP? Well, it, it is very different. A, a classic DSP is generally what's known as a very long instruction word computer. Uh, which means that it takes in a big instruction word with loads of instructions in it, which the compiler has scheduled. Um, and we don't do that at all. We have a essentially what looks like a kind of micro high power, um, high power computing cluster, compute cluster with a shared memory area. So these are free running cores. So here you've got eight synchronized. So there are synchronization primitives, but free running with their own program counter cores. And Basically, that allows us to parallelize things in a much finer grained way. Um, with a VLIW um, uh, kind of architecture, you're really relying on the compiler to parallelize things. Whereas where we can actually just fork something out onto all of these cores. To give you a kind of an example of how that benefits um, versus an uh, LC3 is a Bluetooth low energy codec. If you look at that running on a Hi-Fi 5, five um, versus a gap, nine cluster gap nine cluster will be using about two times less cycles and three times less power per operation so giving you a total of about six times less energy use and then we combine that with some specialized computing um, uh, um, blocks uh, ne16 the smart filtering unit which i think would take too much time to go into super well thanks very much for that um i also have experience with the ti dsps and um, low power so it's yeah it's interesting to see the the different approach there and i hope that e2jw from denver colorado was uh, happy with that answer hello also to um pratt h from uh, the usa and you flip from germany thank you and annie also for joining us today i have another question from matthias and his question is um why have you decided to use the pulp core and not one from sci fi for example I, I think it's, i mean i think i kind of highlighted this in the sense that um you know we have this very very close working relationship between ourselves and 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 the pulp team um and kind of you know pulp team and the open source work that we do with the pulp team is really really almost like an extension of you know our research and development in a sense um and, and we feel that open source is super important in that, you know, that kind of interaction of open source between a real open source university producing open source designs uh, and ourselves is, is a really important thing. And, you know, doing common test chips, doing um, stuff like that. Um, and that's that's not something that we could do with a commercial company. So it's 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 a different relationship. It's not we, we don't need another arm. We need we need a, this kind of different working relationship. It works for us, you know, because we have a very skilled set of chip designers who've got mm -hmm. tens and you know twenties and thirties of years in the in the industry. So, it, would it work for everyone? I'm not sure. Okay, well, we'll leave that with Matthias. I believe he's in our Elector lab, probably downloading the code for that currently to uh, to download on his, to his FPGA because he was talking about that last week in in their live stream, the Elector Lab Talk uh, show. Super. Well, thanks very much, Martin, for all of that insight and an input on using Risk Five in a in an application. 
What we're going to do now is move over to Simon from Imperus and have a look at how those processor cores are actually then designed into a chip and, and, um, and tested. So Simon, welcome back. Thank you very much. Great. Yeah, thanks. And uh, to get my slides up, we... <gasps> there we go. Click a button. Great. Okay. Yeah, thanks very much. And um, so um, I'm from a company called Imperus. And we uh, self we funded this some 12 years ago. And as I said before, my background's from sort of EDA technology, where we've been building simulators. And I've worked in the, the, the cadences and the synopsis with technology, with leading simulation technologies and verification technology there. And one of the things we found in the in the industry, our customers all being sort of chip designers, is that nobody would design a chip without simulation. You know, it's just a standard part of the tool chain. Yeah, there's lots of other tools, but no one would do it. And what what we found was that, you know, you know, sort of 15 years ago, everyone's building electronic products and all of those products were going to be defined by software is what we believe. And what we, we realized is that people were not doing simulation. They were just running the software on prototypes and everything, which is a real challenge. And like nobody designs a chip without simulation, we believe that nobody should develop sort of embedded software and firmware without simulation got to use technology to do it it's far too complex especially when you have more than one core you know with several calls or interacting in there in different bits of the design and everything and so we basically we build simulation technologies and tools and debuggers and and models so that we can build a simulation model of an, a, an electronic product which behaves exactly like the hardware so the software can be developed and got up and running without the prototyping without the silicon and we also help people getting the designs correct. And one of the, the key benefits of that is that you can start with the simulation way before you've even fit, you know, got started almost with the RTL. And, you know, we had one of our customers that was a 1.2 billion uh, gate um, inference engine, actually. Wow. You know, they'd actually got their simulation framework and everything up and running on the simulation 18 months before they taped out the chip. So they had a long time to flush it all out. And it, it was fantastic. So it can help people really shrink the development time. So in Pyrrhus background, our focus is tools to help people do electronic product design around simulating their processes. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so just to, to look at the types of tools we have, and there are a variety of different things. The key central bit in the blue bit is what we sort of call a virtual prototype or virtual platform. And that has models of CPUs, models of behavioral components, peripherals and things in a sort of a, an electronic simulation model of a hardware platform. And that is, is designed in such a way that it can run the software without any changes. So we can take the same binary you might run in, on a, an existing design and it'll just run on one of our virtual platforms. So it allows you to really um, get the software correct very early on. And that runs on a simulator. We have a very sophisticated sort of simulation technology. You get that up and running. You have to, you can have some sort of test bench technology. You can get your full operating systems and everything to run. And then we have this technology to, yeah, you know, we have debug technology so you can control the software running. But we also have these other analysis and verification tools, which allow you to monitor what's going on as the software is running in a non-intrusive way and analyze what's happening. So, you know, you can run it through the debugger, see what's happening, sure. But we can actually look not just at the instructions or the C, but we can watch how the operating system is running. So we can profile running software, we can look at the code, we can see what's going on at a detailed level across the whole platform, where we can look into multiple processors and multiple processes running in the software. And we can yeah. do very good we have very good controllability and visibility of what's going on in the software. And that's ex very important because modern electronic products are really complicated with multiple, lots of processes and components. And so you really need good insights in there, in tools that you can run in your continuous integration environments and run yeah. very efficiently in that. And one of, the, one of the big challenges, if we move now to sort of the risk five, um, uh, part of this so is is the complexity of the modeling that you need mm -hmm. and you know we heard martin talk about risk five and the freedoms it give you one of the key things that that they did very well with risk five is say okay there's a basic set of instructions on 40 instructions which is a base and then on top of that we can layer extensions 
uh, instruction in extensions. So they could be maybe for mathematics, where you've got hardware multiply and divide in there, so you don't have to do it in software. You know, they can be um, for the floating point that you can add in there. Vector stuff, as Martin was talking, hardware loops in the pulp. So you, you have all of these, uh, the ability as part of the design of the ISA to extend it into and give you the freedom to, to have basically hardware running soft, uh, software to target different application areas that your electronic product may have. And, and one of the key challenges in, in, in sort of modeling this is RISC V, yeah, there's basically 40 something basic instructions, but with the standards that are out there being what they call ratified or being ratified, you get up to almost a thousand instructions, you know, because wow. there's 300 vector instructions, 300 DSP instructions. So there can be lots of ones and you can choose which ones. And from, from our point of view, we've got customers who need a reference model of these. And actually these standards evolve and you can see there on the slide, you know, the different down the page, different extensions, but actually across the page, you know, the different version numbers. And one mm. of the key things that you need from a reference is to be able to dial exactly the configuration that you're putting into your design or that you've, you've got access to. And so one of the things that, 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 that a lot of people are using Imperius for as a reference is because we have that configurability in there. And, you know, RISC V really for Imperius is sort of the last five years before that, and, and still today, half our businesses around ARM and the other processes, we were used by a lot of ARM customers, a lot of MIPS customers, PowerPC, all, all, all of these sort of embedded electronic products. And RISC-V yeah. is a relatively new one for, for us in the last five years. And we've become basically the reference model um, for that. And to use that model, yes, we can use it in the virtual platform so you can boot your Linuxes and develop software on them and everything. But also the challenge is, is that Everybody can design their own processes, and so they need some form of verification environment in there. Yeah. And and you know on the right here you can see that okay sorry in the middle there's a people have a design and they'll have some memory and things around it in the core, and then on the right they've got they're going to have some form of test bench so they can stimulate it and control it and clock it and maybe monitor what's going on and put random instructions into it to test it, and they need some form of verification to know well does their design that they the pipelines that they're implementing and everything, does that actually uh, match the RISC V specification? Does it function correctly? And one of the things we've done is we've used our, you know, many years of experience in, in the verification world and the hardware EDA world to build a technology we call Imperius DB, which is a verification environment that can just sit behind your test bench and monitor sort of like an assertion, everything that's going on in your design at an architectural level so you can run tons of software through it and at every event every instruction every in exception every debug event or interrupt we're comparing the full state of the reference model against your design so it makes it very easy to see if your design is actually complying with what you're expecting to do the spec and the standard and the great thing about our model is because it's very configurable it can be exactly what you've chosen to implement, the subset or your own, it's very easy to extend it with custom instructions because one of the beauties of RISC-V is you can add your own instructions to it. And of course, our model allows you to do that. And it's hooked up by, there's a blue line called RVVI, RISC-V verification interface, which is a standard that's starting to be adopted to be an interface between the reference components and the, the cores, which means you can get reuse and, and, and things like that, which is very important. So, you know, Imperius were involved with three different things, really, the, the modeling of the components, the tools which allow you to, to develop software on it, and then the verification environment for the RISC-V processes. Okay. So, as you were saying the, earlier, the, the RISC-V ISA is obviously based, uh, based on lots of individual parts. We've got, for example, the integer instructions, we've got some of the floating point instructions, uh, and there's different versions of those, uh, the vectoring extensions, there, there's lots of different versions of those. As a user of risk of a RISC-V um, based processor or, or microcontroller, is there some sort of set of registers where I can read out and find out what version is actually implemented on that device? How, how do we sort of communicate to the compiler uh, which instructions are actually available? Yeah, so that's a really good question, Stuart. And it's been, been quite a complex 
path to have been trodden by the risk five world ecosystem in there and because it has evolved and it you know there's several different ones moving forward but what um, what risk five international the body out of switzerland that looks after it, which is a global organization a non-profit that we're all members of what they've done is they've set up you know a, a very uh, sort of controlled process of getting them standardized. And you can see on the right of each one of those, there's 1.0. And that's what they call the sort of ratified specification. I think actually only the DSP is not yet uh, ratified on this. So it's still evolving. And what happens is that all the different groups will work and evolve it and they'll sort of publish an interim version and the tool chains will work on it. The models will work on it. People will be trying to implement it in the silicon in RTL. People don't tend to go to silicon, but un until it's ratified, and that is where it's, everybody's sort of happy that that subset is sort of good for purpose. It's firm. It's flushed out with most ambiguities gone, and there's a there's a sort of cooling off period, and then the board and everybody accepts it, and it becomes ratified. And that's when the tool chains and the tools like the compilers tend to be upstream into the main line of GCC and, and LLVM. And so typically, most people implement from the 1.0 versions unless right. they're doing something special themselves where they'll either work on the development one and then that's up to them how they do it and they tend to be involved actively in the working groups on that or they, they build their own uh, solution like the pulp guys did a very good set of instructions which none of some of those are just nowhere near risk five yet in in the standards like the hardware loop stuff because it does a very good job and it you know, at some point there might be a standard version of that but yeah it is it is one of the challenges is what version but most people go with the they wait until it is standardized because mm -hmm. what you want is the support as martin said from the ecosystem where you need all the tool chains in there you don't and what the tool chains guys have done is said they really only want to upstream things which are stable and ratified and and what's happening is that there's a new initiative in RISC-V International, new, it's been going three years actually, to work out what they call uh, uh, profiles and platforms, because you've sort of got a smorgasbord of 30 different extensions you could have, but actually, what are you going to have? And they're trying to put them in packages to say, okay, this is one for a, a, a pretty comprehensive uh, embedded uh, controller. This is the components it would have. It would probably have these five things, whereas... An uh, applications processor wanting to run Linux, it's going to require these. And so the, the RISC-V International is working with its groups underneath it, but also with the tool chains, part of the ecosystem, to try and bring that together so that there will be sort of standard clusterings of these things. So, okay, this is this application, this is that application. But it 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 is stabilizing. Three years ago, it was <laughs> like walking across a marsh. It was quite <laughs> But, you know, we, we do have a lot of customers that do have dotted versions because they, they've gone, okay, we, we're going to RTL with this and they've gone, they've gone to vectors in 0.71 and the, they, they end up having to help a lot with the tool chains and where some have gone bit minute 0.92 and some 1.0. So, yes, it is a challenge. And one of the, the, the things is it's is, 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 is been very good from an Imperius point of view because our modeling technology was built originally to deal with the arms and the MIPS, which kept evolving as well. We had this technology, so with RISC Five, you know, we've got all the dials and switches to do that. So our model yeah. is very good at being selectable to exactly the design that the person has. So it's good for the software that they're putting on it, and it's good for the verification. So I think one of the other key elements of RISC Five that uh, obviously Martin has touched on is this ability to develop custom instructions, which isn't really something that's possible for. Um, for other processor architectures that you that you buy um, or not in in the same level of um, flexibility let's say so if i want to develop a, a new instruction something like this uh, dot vector product that martin was mentioning for the the gap um, processors um, how do i start do i do i sit down and start developing some vhdl code and and try to to develop from there or is, or is there a like a higher level modeling um, process that I can use just to yeah. try out the concept of an instruction. No, so I think if you wanted a dot product, you'd probably go with the pulp one and go with Martin's. You wouldn't need to, re <laughs> to reinvent that. But but yeah, it is. I mean, I think that's one of the the key innovations really of of the Risk Five technology. And it's interesting. Martin talked about open cores. I'd sort of forgotten that when we started in Pyrus, we we wanted a technology we could use as a demonstrator where we could get. A, um, a sort of a, 
uh, the RTL, get a tool, get a to compile. And we actually was, for the first several years, we used a lot of the open cores stuff, but obviously we moved to RISC-5. But so, yeah, I mean, I think that with with RISC-5 and, and custom extensions, the thing that RISC-5 does, which it nobody else does, is it, it gives you complete freedom to extend it. it. As part of the fundamental design, it says, this area is for extension. You know, this is, you can add things here, 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 and here, and it won't have, get in the way of the rest of the solution. And that was a brilliant uh, concept for this extendability. And I and I think that that's the key thing it gives is this freedom to innovate. Now, it doesn't say the other companies don't have it. MIPS had a way of extending it. And actually we worked with ARM. They've got some ways of extending their instructions in a more controlled way than RISC-5. RISC-5 in some way could be a complete can of worse because you can do anything you like. Which of course. Is but that's okay because it means you don't have to invent, you're just using it for yourself. And that's a perfectly good answer. If you're trying to be part of the sort of standard so you can make use of all the tools, you are constrained a little bit. But what it does is it does gives you freedom to do two things. One is add your own sort of state and instructions. You can just add to it and there's a very clean way from an ISA point of view to do that. But also from an architecture, you know, you can put the cores together with this network on a chip or this type of bus, or they could lockstep each other, or they could be in all these different processing elements. And, you know, so we have people with hundreds of cores on their design, all different configurations. So it gives you complete freedom. And I think that from a, it could be a real challenge to how to do that. And one of the things that we've done uh, with Imperis, you know, just plug in Imperis a little bit, is that, you know, we designed our, our simulation technology. So you have the basic, what we call our envelope model, which is the risk five standard and all of 200, 300 configuration options. Then we have the ability to add a sort of an extension library, your own versions of it. And because all our models are sort of open source, you can see exactly how we've done things. And then you can add things on top of it in a without touching the envelope model. You can add your own instructions, your own state, your other things there. So we've got a technology which allows you to extend it all in source yourself. So it's in, in using all the, the APIs we normally use. And the thing we've done, which actually is, I think is very good, is that if you add these extensions, then all our tools work with it. So that, you know, our debugger works with it, the uh, disassembler all works with it, the breakpoints, the tracing, the coverage, the profiling, everything just works with your own instructions. And because for us, it doesn't matter whether it's internal or external. And so I think that I think that the, the great thing about RISC V is it gives you this freedom, but you have to be really careful because it it gives maybe inexperienced engineers too much freedom. And I mean, one of my my, my colleagues who spent years in at works in, in Imperius and but worked in our MIPS and imagination, actually, he said the challenge that people don't realize is that that if you add another feature you're doubling the amount of verification you've got to do. So it's easy exactly. to just add this little verification feature here, but actually, it, you know, the complexity so that you do, it gives you, it gives the engineers freedom, but I think you need the management needs to be a bit more structured, especially with the verification, you know, because you need better metrics and what you're trying to cover and how you do the functional coverage. But, yeah. but you know, there, there, there's, you know, in, in, in the hardware design world, you know, there's been 20, 30 years of experience from the main guys, how you do, you know, verification for blocks and for, you know, and actually you mentioned VHDL. I'm the last person to ask about that because I am I was one of the developers of Verilog System Verilog. So you don't talk to me about it. But yeah, an HDL, yes. Yeah. And I would just say, though, that, you know, I, I look at it from a modeling point of view in RISC five, but there are several companies that we deal with, like, you know, there's the, the main IP providers out there for RISC five. They all have solutions for um, extending, whether it's from their own sort of scripting language with their own tools. They have ways to add to an extender. And from a verification, from a reference point of view, we have models of these different vendors, of course, because we've got like some like 80 different models of RISC five now. Yeah. And, and they have ways of extending them. So our technology allows it to be extended based on their inputs so we work with these people and so that yes you can just randomly write rtl and write models but actually there are if, if you choose an ip vendor they often have ways of in a controlled way to extend it to make mm -hmm. to, to to handhold you through the process which yeah. you know so um but it, you know just to some you know risk five it's about freedom to innovate 
Super. And then and just one last question um, around this, this area of, of tools and, and modeling and verification. Um, obviously, RISC-V, open source, people are automatically thinking free, but you're running a very successful business. Um, how far can I get on no money um, when I want to, to use tools to, to work with RISC-V, verify designs, develop uh, custom instructions before I actually maybe actually need to put some money on the table. Yeah, so I'm, you know, you, you're right. I run a company which is a commercial company that we make money by building products to help our customers get their silicon designed, right? That, that's our focus is to help customers get to silicon. And, you know, but we, we realize that one of the, you know, that we live in a world where, where um, you know, open source is a fantastic thing. We are a big supporter of open source. We use a lot of it ourselves internally, but we, we believe it, it's a very good idea. And RISC-V isn't actually open source. It's an open standard, like C is an open standard, right? And so that's what RISC-V International does. But there's an awful lot of great open source technologies out there. And so, you know, how far can you get now, you know, if you want a, a, a compiler to take C and turn it in, absolutely, GCC, LLVM, I doubt there's going to be many commercial technologies. If you want a debugger as well, there are like that. Where if you want a synthesis tool to take from an HDL and turn it into place and route, you know, I think there are big challenges there. And I, so I think, you know, or a simulator, you know, we, we, we have a commercial simulator. We actually give away two, two levels of, free simulation as well to try and help the industry from our OVP world site. And we have a GitHub where you can download a reference, which actually a lot of people are using their risk five OVP sim um, in there. And, but I think, you know, from a um, open source point of view, there are some very good tools out there, you know, I mean, you know, risk five, the base stuff isn't too hard. You know, a grad student can build a pretty good simulator. Mm -hmm. but will it have all the versions? Will it all be accurate? Will it be used by many people as their sign-off simulator to silicon? And yeah. I think that people do get confused with this sort of free freedom, open source. And I think the thing, you know, my, my the pragmatic view is for me is that RISC Five is gives you the freedom to innovate and build the next generation of fantastic electronic products. That's very different from can I do it with free tools? Now. You know, the customers we tend to deal with are the people that are looking to change the world, change the marketing, building the next technology that does this, that, or the next thing to 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 capture a change in the, the world, whether it's earbuds here or whether it's a data engine huge, the data center. And so I think that, yes, you can get done. There's open source technologies out there. It's good technology, all sorts of things. But if you need to get something done quickly with high quality, where you've got Commercially, you need somebody on the end of the phone when you don't get something right or something breaks or something. You need support. You need some help. Then what we're finding is that the sort of serious chip guys are using serious solutions. And yeah. you have to pay. You sort of get what you pay for. It's not quite fair. Cause that <laughs> very good. But, you know, we the customers we have tend to be people that are doing very complicated things. They're very concerned about security or quality, and they mm -hmm. want to use sort of best-in-class technologies and people that have had a lot of experience in that space. I guess the, the nice thing is if you're in the position that Martin was where you're actually trying to start a, a semiconductor vendor and you want to prove to maybe investors that your idea and your concept can actually work, then obviously for very for, for no money or little money, you can actually make that uh, that kickoff and starting process. Yeah, absolutely. So, you can build yeah. sort of early demonstrators and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, where would we be without open source? I mean, the whole web is... You know, everything. Based upon it, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's fantastic. Smashing. I'm just going to go back to our questions and see who else is um, popping questions in for us. Um, a quick hello to Chris Rao um, and also to Dieter Brunzel, who's uh, based in Germany. Now, Chris Rao has a question. He says, um, are there any plans for implementing the RISC-V pulp core in sub-threshold voltage silicon circuitry? Now, I don't know um, if you know what the, the pulp guys are up to. Maybe, Martin, has, has there been any discussion of that sort of, um, using that sort of silicon process to, to develop well, Gap, a core? Gap9 is actually operating pretty much near threshold, so it's it's uh, yeah. 0.65 volt uh, cores, right. the lowest core voltage. Um, I, I'm not really aware of, of and, and if I was doing something or we were doing something, couldn't really discuss what we were doing. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, that's, but, okay. Gap nine is at 0.65 at the moment. Yeah. 
And then um, another, maybe a question for, for you, Martin, um, you mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, Risk five as well, um, this, this collection of, of documentation that describes how it works and so on and so forth. But who's actually in charge of, of looking after this, this, this great um, project? And um, you know, how, how would I or any of our viewers um, get involved? Oh, the, the Risk Five organization. Yeah, so there's an, there's an organization that's an um, international organization, head offices in Geneva, um, which shows also the fact that it's, it's trying to be neutral um, as an organization. And there's mm -hmm. a load of standards committees that are within that organization. There are student memberships to it, um, and uh, then there are company memberships to it, and there are work groups that, that you can propose yourself onto um inside that organization okay and uh perhaps to simon uh, if i was interested in actually uh, trying out some some risk five um core and and learning a bit more about the tooling that goes around it where's the best starting point uh, for me well actually i think a search on youtube is probably a good thing because there's a you know a lot of uh, youtube and risk five international uh, as Martin said out of geneva they they hold these summits and um, forums and they record most of those presentations and they're all on YouTube and a lot of it's going to be a bit academic and uh, evolving the the extensions and things you know because that's what they're very excited about I mean from a from a you see you know at the conferences you know there's there's people demonstrating the tools there is a whole ecosystem of IP providers and tool vendors and you know if you, you look at risk five international go and have a look at the list of members the go link and just I would prod some of the, the vendors and say, look, we're interested in this. If, if you want something open source, just to plug what we do, I, on one of the slides, I had something, I didn't talk about it, called OVP, mm -hmm. Open Virtual Platforms, ovpworld.org. In there, it's on the bottom of my slide too, I think. Yeah, down there. there. We go. <clears throat> this is one of the things, when we when we started in Pyrrhus, we realized that, that we wanted to build the simulation technology, but we didn't want to really build all these models. We wanted to create an API, which we could be as a sort of an open standard, and then, we built a lot of models and made them open source under Apache. And people can go to OVP World, they can register and get a 90 day license to pretty much all of our simulation technology and models using all these open source models. So we've got models of ARM booting, SMP Linux, um, 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 some, some um, RISC V stuff, MIP stuff, all of these different, it's like 300 behavioral components and processes there, about 50 different platforms with different RTOSs and that can run an open source and there's debug so you can do that. So you can get there and we, we set that up to try and educate people about developing software on virtual platforms, virtual prototypes, OVP world. And you know people can download a 90 day evaluation. For hobbyists, we can let them extend it. We provide it to hundreds of universities that use it for teaching. And for commercial users, they can use it as an evaluation vehicle and hopefully come and See, see something that they like this. So we help educate people, they can explore. But obviously that's only the technologies that Empiris provide. If they want to look at some of the open source stuff, go to the GitHubs by RIS5 and, and drill down from that. Because there's, there's, there's a tremendous amount of technology. I mean, and that is one of the challenges with open source. There's 100,000 open source repositories, and there's probably only about a couple of hundred that really are useful. And right. He's <laughs> finding those. But RISC 5 International is a lot of pretty good stuff out there. But yeah. um, and, and, and RISC 5 International also, I think, has a sort of an education bit to it. We don't tend to. Yeah, they do. They have an educational university mm -hmm. program that they, they right. do. And there's there's a lot of materials around that as well. Um, yeah. I would yeah. also encourage you to go to the RISC 5 um, um, International site uh, website, yeah. and they've got lots of pointers on that. To, to different things. Yeah, and I think I think and Martin said is you know I think as an associate member as an individual you can just sign up. There's no cost, I don't think. Obviously, mm. commercial companies have to or institutions have to pay different amounts going all the way up. Yeah. But and and if you join that, you can you can basically just visit any of the working groups. And any day, there's about four or five going on. And some of them are very technical. Some of them are going to be around education, and you know some are around platforms. Some are around. They tend to be around. The ISA, though, they're not around. Where can I get an open source core? You know, there are other yeah. organizations like Open Hardware or Chips Alliance that you can focus on if you want to download sort of quality open source mm -hmm. things. You need it sort of maintained rather than just a random website. So I, I think that there's a lot of people will help people, you know, 
I think, I think one thing one thing to remember is that open, the Risk Five, at its origin, was an educational tool. I mean, it course, was yeah, developed yeah. by uh, David Patterson, Professor David Patterson, who was the originator of Risk, as a teaching tool to show people, you know, if I change this instruction layout, what happens to my core design? Yeah. Um, so you know, it 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 is a teaching tool. Now it's it's gone way beyond that, but but uh, but definitely its roots are in teaching. And I think if any of our viewers want to find out any more about Risk Five, the website from Elector, ElectorMagazine.com, has also lots of articles where Risk Five is mentioned. And my colleague Matthias Clausen showed an FPGA board running a Risk Five core recently, and I've written a few articles which explain what Risk Five is. And we also covered the Risk Five based ESP32 in a recent blog post on on the website. So we also have that there. We're quickly coming to the end. I'm just going to see what other questions we might have here and comments from our audience. Uh, there's Gerrit Yates as well. Uh, he's only just got home, unfortunately, so I'm for <laughs> you've missed quite a lot <laughs> to, to answer your question. Yeah. Um, but of course, you could watch, yeah, exactly. You'll be able to come back onto YouTube or go onto LinkedIn or even Twitter and see a replay of the video and find out all about what Imperis and uh, green waves have been doing in the field of risk five technology and also on twitter i think we've we've covered all the key points so that only uh, remains for me to say thank you very much to my guests today to uh, simon from imperis and martin from green waves technology thanks so much for your time today and providing all those engineering insights around risk five usage deployment modeling verification and your contribution to the risk five community thanks guys great thank, thank you, you very much Stuart and Alexa. Yeah, thank you Stuart. so that's all we have time for today i'm afraid um oh uh, that's gone wrong so uh, my takeaway is that risk five is really offering engineers a processor architecture that allows them to innovate without just relying on the next moore's law breakthrough Many thanks to my guests today, Martin Kroom from Green Waves Technologies and Simon Davidman from Impera Software. I've really enjoyed the insights you've provided us with today. Coming up next time, for the, in preparation for the PCIM exhibition in Nuremberg, I'll be exploring wide band gap devices such as GAN from InnoScience and learning how engineers migrate from silicon MOSFETs to these devices. We'll also be asking our guests when it makes sense to transition, and which applications currently benefit the most from wide band gap. If you've enjoyed the show and want to see what else we've planned, you can also drop by the Elector Engineering Insights page at electormagazine.com slash Elector Engineering Insights. And don't forget to take a look in on my colleagues Jens and Matthias in their next show, Lab Talk, streaming live on the 28th of April. So that wraps it up for today. Please like, subscribe, and share wherever you are watching. And don't forget, if you'd like to join me as a guest, write to me via email, drop me a tweet, or reach out to me, Stuart Cording, on LinkedIn. Thanks for joining, stay in touch, and don't forget to keep asking your engineering questions.